What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I am back. It is your boy, Brad, and this is the one. This is the video that you guys have been requesting super highly, man. I've gotten more, this video requested more than any other video ever. So, fluid and electrolytes, man. Let's get to know them. Nurse Bass Rocks. All right, guys, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. I want to kind of make this quick. Hopefully it is. Um, I'm not going to go very in-depth because you guys don't want to watch an hour-long video. So we're going to skim the surface. I'm going to give you guys some nitty-gritty need-to-know information, and hopefully it helps you guys out. So fluids and electrolytes. Okay, whenever we're talking about this, what we need to understand is that there are three main compartments, okay? The first one is your intracellular fluid. The second one, extracellular fluid. And the third one is your third spaces. Whenever we're talking about intracellular fluid, we're literally talking about the fluid that is within the cell, right? Whenever we talk about the cytoplasm, we're talking about all of the components that make up a cell. That's what we're talking about whenever we talk about intracellular fluid. And there are some electrolytes that are more prominent in the intracellular fluid as opposed to the extracellular fluid. Whenever we talk about the extracellular fluid, that is simply all of the fluid that is not inside of the cell, right? The uh, fluid that is within the intravascular compartment, that's your extracellular fluid. Now, let me take you guys on a side note real quick. Let's talk about the third one, the third spaces. Whenever we talk about the third spaces, we're talking about compartments or cavities where fluid is not supposed to be, right? Whenever we talk about the peritoneal cavity, if you have fluid collection in your peritoneal cavity, we're looking at ascites, right? Maybe from a hepatic failure. If we have uh, fluid in the pleural cavity, you're looking at a pleural effusion, right? You got uh, uh, fluid in the um, pericardial cavity, you're looking at cardiac tamponade, places where fluid is not supposed to be. Additionally, if you're talking about the uh, interstitial tissues, the interstitial fluid, that is also considered a third space, a place where fluid is not supposed to be. Whenever you see patients, it's really, it's really a, a battle of pressures. You have a pressure in your interstitial fluid that is pushing uh, fluid back into the intravascular compartment. And then you have a pressure within the intravascular compartment that is pushing fluid, pushing pressure against the vessel to get fluid out. And it is a very homeostatic balance of these two pressures that keeps fluid within the intravascular compartment and out of the interstitial fluid. What happens, however, is whenever you have a greater intravascular pressure than an interstitial pressure, fluid is forced from the intravascular compartment and into the interstitial uh, tissue. This is why you may see patients who have edema of the legs or of the arms. This is also the same concept of why fluid ends up in the peritoneal cavity or in the pleural cavity or the pericardial cavity, right? The pressure within the intravascular is greater than the pressure in the interstitial fluid and fluid gets forced or plasma gets forced into these third spaces. That was a little side note. So now that we've talked about fluid a little bit, let's also get into uh, how do we get fluid into our bodies, okay? The main way, you think about drinking water, you get water in and it gets absorbed through your digestive tract, primarily in the large intestine. You can also get it intravenously. If you have to have an IV started and get fluids pushed to bolus or whatever, that's another mechanism, a mean, a route by which you get fluid into your body. And then the ways that you get rid of fluid, um, you know, your renal system, the urinary system, you excrete it through urine, you also get rid of fluid through uh, defecation, feces. Um, you get rid of fluid through diaphoresis, through sweating, and also through your respiratory tract. By exhaling, you lose a minute amount, but it is still an amount of fluid. And whatever, this is a key thing you need to know, whatever amount of fluid you put into your body, you need to be putting that out. That is homeostasis. Now, speaking of homeostasis, that's the big key to guys. You really need to know that you need to understand that this is how things are supposed to operate at a homeostatic level. Let's talk about the electrolytes very briefly. Uh, it's important for you to go and I suggest you do it on your own. Go study what each electrolyte does within the body and its importance and what a high or a low uh, level may indicate. And also make sure you know the normal ranges, people. It's important for you to, uh, to know those whenever you're looking at lab values on your patients or whenever you're taking exams to know those normal ranges. But some of your major electrolytes that you really need to be concerned with is your sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, phosphate, calcium, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate, all of these things. It's, it's like a, it's like a well-orchestrated symphony, right? They are all placed within intra and extracellular fluid in such perfect amounts that homeostasis is maintained and the body functions as it should. But what I want to do is I want to take a couple seconds and demonstrate to you guys an example of what happens whenever things do not function properly. But what happens whenever homeostasis is not maintained, whenever there's a pathology or something of that sort and homeostasis is disrupted. That's why it's really important to understand fluid and electrolytes and their importance in the body. So what I want to do is I want to give you guys a quick little example. And hopefully this is going to help you understand fluid and electrolytes a little bit better. So let's talk about sodium. 
sodium is primarily in your extracellular fluid. Um, so what you need to understand here is there is a certain level of sodium within your blood that is normal. The normal range is 135 to 145. So here's how I want to demonstrate this for you guys. Here, this is your blood. Here, this is your sodium. Now look, look what I'm doing. Bam. Okay. The amount of sodium, let's say hypothetically, the amount of sodium that I just put in here is your normal range. You are between 135 and 145. Perfect. That's where you want to be. Your body's loving you right now. What happens if too much sodium gets put into your blood? This is what is referred to as hypernatremia. Your patient is hypernatremic. Okay. You have too much sodium in your blood and that is problematic. So this is, this is why it's good to use this glass of water to conceptualize this. How do you cure this problem? What you're really looking at is there is too great of a concentration of sodium in your blood. How do you cure it? How would you dilute this amount of sodium to get that sodium level back between 135 and 145? you would add more water. So let's say, for instance, if this was your patient and they're hypernatremic, what you want to do is you want to have them increase your oral intake of fluids. You have the IV started, right? Start pushing fluids to dilute the sodium in the blood and get that back into that homeostatic 135 to 145 range. So that is how you can take that idea and put it into practice in a clinical uh, environment. Now let's take this same patient. Okay. Let's say we did push fluids on them. We got a lot of fluids into them. We did dilute out that sodium and we got it back to 135 to 145. But let's say we accidentally went a little bit too far, right? And uh, we have too much fluid in here, right? And our patient is now hyponatremic. There is too little sodium in the blood. Okay because we have too much fluid we are over diluted okay this is just the way that you could think about it to help conceptualize it you are now over diluted too much water too little sodium so how do we go about reversing this okay well what you could think of is yes you could have some sort of a sodium replacement to increase your sodium levels but what i have heard and found to be gold standard treatment from physicians is they will uh, place a fluid restriction. The patient is not to have more than a thousand cc's of fluid intake a day because you really want the kidneys and all those mechanisms by which fluid escapes the body. You want those to keep flushing the fluid out of the body while restricting the amount that you put in. That's one way that you could do it. And you could also see a physician possibly order a diuretic, a diuretic of some sort to flush additional fluid out of the body and, um, retain the sodium so that way you get back between that nice 135 and 145 homeostatic range i say all of this to say this i know this was very brief and pretty quickly but i didn't want to drag on this too long you can do some studying on your own but i hope this gave you a nice introduction to fluid and electrolytes but i say all of that to say this fluid and electrolytes is extremely important man dive into your book and study it study it and know it like the back of your hand you will carry it forward with you it is not just a fundamentals of nursing course or an anatomy and physiology concept it is something you will carry forward with you. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video, man. Be sure to share it with a friend, a fellow nursing student, somebody who you think might need it and could benefit from it. Be sure to leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about it. Be sure to subscribe down below. I'm putting out helpful content, motivational material, educational content every week here on my channel. So be sure to subscribe and join me again next week for the next video. It's Nurse Bass, soon to be. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.